Welcome back. This is the Tutor Wizard. I'm Adrian. Please subscribe right here and hit the notification bell to get notifications for other things on our channel. Linear Algebra 1, Chapter 2 is matrices. Section 2.4 is determinants and their properties. What we're going to do this lecture is even more determinant properties and some examples of how we use those determinant properties to compute efficiently or as quickly as possible the number associated to the n by n matrix. Let's get to it. I got one of them anyways. There's Alice. She wants to do determinant properties. I know. That's her brother's running around. Go get him then. You want to do more? Okay. Where's your brother? There they are, Ringo and Alice being monsters, running around wrecking everything while we're doing stuff. So we're going to do five more determinant properties. There's a couple other ones, but I'm sure you're sick of these, and these are the ones that are going to be useful. One says if you have the determinant of A transpose, that's going to be the same thing, the same number as if you computed the determinant of the original matrix A. Why is this? This is a direct consequence or corollary to the cofactor expansion theorem. If I have A and I choose to compute the determinant using cofactor expansion along row one, say, then when I transpose, that becomes column one in A transpose, and then I'll just cofactor expand along column one in A transpose, I'll get the exact same number because it's all the same computations. That's essentially, I just wave my hands literally and figuratively at the proof of that. This one, I'm going to show you in a second. We'll actually show that one, how we put our algebraic rules together to prove other statements using the object matrix now. They're both doing that. Kid A. Number three is if you have A is an upper or lower triangular matrix, then the determinant is just the product of the diagonal entries. A is upper triangular. Again, at first this is confusing. We call it upper triangular if there's zeros below because the information is in the upper triangle. But the idea now is if I cofactor, here's a way of hand at the proof, if I cofactor expand along column one, then I don't really have to compute C21 or any of these other cofactors because when I cofactor expand along this, then I'm going to multiply by zero. So all we're going to do is it'll be A11 times this sub n by n, n minus 1 by n minus 1 determinant. Once I have that, then I'm going to do the same thing. I'll cofactor expand along the column 1, and then I'll get all the way down. And the determinant for that is just going to be the product of the diagonal entries. Same thing if I have a lower triangle. This is lower triangular. Why? Because the information is in the lower triangle. I have zeros above the main diagonal. Then when I do that, if I cofactor expand along this row now instead, then I don't have to calculate these cofactors C12 all the way to C1n because they're going to be multiplied by 0 anyway. So it doesn't matter what they are. They're not going to add to the determinant. It'll just be this one times this sub n minus 1 by n minus 1 determinant. And then when I do that, I'll do the same thing. I'll just cofactor expand along that top row and then all the way down, you're just going to get b11 times b22 times all the way to bnn at the end. That's essentially the proof of why the upper or lower triangular matrices have the determinant, which is the product of the diagonals. That the determinant of the identity matrix is 1 because identity matrix is a diagonal matrix. Every entry is a 1 on the diagonal. So it'll just be 1 multiplied by itself n times, which is going to be 1. All right, proof of 5 and 2. Basically, 5, I just wanted to show you because this is going to be my strategy anyways, using a combination of cofactor expansion and our determinant rules. When you're given an arbitrary matrix, it's obviously not going to be the identity matrix. But what we're going to try and do is get a leading 1 and get zeros below it using our determinant properties. Then I'm going to use cofactor expansion to cofactor expand, which is what I'm doing right here. Cofactor expand along the top row. Then I don't really need to compute any of those cofactors. It's just going to be 1 times this sub n minus 1 by n minus 1 determinant, which is the cofactor, because it's the first one, m11, so the cofactor is equal to the minor also. So it'll be 1 times this guy. And then, but now I have the n minus 1 by n minus 1 identity matrix, essentially. This is one less, one size smaller identity matrix. So I'll do the same thing. Cofactor span along the top row. I'll get another 1 come out. I'll have 1 times 1, and then a sub n minus 2 by n minus 2 identity matrix and I keep going and then I have dot 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 ones and then I have n minus two ones here and then I have times a two by two determinant and this is the Matryoshka doll. Once I get down to the Matryoshka doll of the two by two then I compute. This is AD minus BC, 1 times 1 minus 0 times 0, which is 1. So we do get, in fact, 
or it's an immediate consequence to all upper and lower triangular matrices or diagonal matrices. Any one of these guys, that's the technique that you're going to do. And this is the technique I'm going to train you even if you don't have a matrix which is a nice upper or lower triangular. We're going to get a leading one in the top left corner, get zeros below it, cofactor expand along that column. Then you have one and by one smaller determinant to compute. Then we'll do the same trick and that's how we're going to efficiently compute determinants. As a consequence of these now, we can show that the determinant of if an, a matrix is invertible, then the determinant of the inverse of that matrix is just one over the original determinant. How do we get at that? We start using properties like these ones and results that we had from the previous video. So go watch the previous video and it shows you that the determinant of a product is the product of the determinants. What? That says I'm about to use the determinant of A times B is the determinant of A times the determinant of B. And everyone nods and goes, yeah, that seems to make sense. That's a non-trivial thing to prove, first of all. But A and B are arbitrarily representing anybody in the set of two by two matrices. So I can put this as C and D for you. It doesn't matter if I have an N by N and an N by N matrices and I multiply them together. I don't care what you call them. In particular, if you had A and an A inverse, that's still two matrices. I can still split it. And that's exactly what I'm going to do cleverly in this move. So I'm going to use that thing that we've already proved from the previous theorem and this to combine them to prove number two. What does that mean? I'm going to reverse it. So one is equal to the determinant of I n. We just did that by number five, if you want the justification. I just wanted to be true, so I wrote it equals. It's not how we do it. Now what I'm going to cleverly do is use a property from the definition of what an inverse matrix is. Assuming that the inverse of A exists, we can write as identity is A times A inverse. And that's the axiom we have and everyone always nods, but you see, really we should have wrote it like this. You can introduce A and A inverse if you have identity anywhere you have it. Aha, uh -huh, I just did it. Now what am I going to do? Now I'm going to use the theorem which says the product of the determinant is the determinant of the product. So I have the product, I can split this. This is the determinant of A times the determinant of A minus one. What does that say? This is transitivity of equality. Now I can cut out the middleman. Let's just cut, cut those out. And this is going to say that one is equal to the determinant of A times the determinant of A minus one. This has to be non-zero because it's invertible. We didn't really go through this, but if your matrix is invertible, the determinant is non-zero. So I can now know that I had to check. I'm going to divide by it, but that says now the determinant of A minus one is equal to one over the determinant of A. That's what we're getting at. All right, now for an example, let A be this matrix, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then one, two, three. And we're going to assume at the gate that the determinant of A we've already computed and we know is three. Then what you're given is compute the determinant of these following matrices. And everyone's like, what the heck are we doing? We're trying to show you in the previous video and in this video, all those properties that we listed, you have to memorize them all or get used to them all a little bit, especially the main three. So this is, even though I just listed five other examples, I'm going to focus on the first main three. If you interchange two rows or two columns, you get a negative every time. If you multiply a single row by a factor, you have to multiply the determinant by the same factor. And if I replace a row by that row added to a multiple of another row, that won't change the determinant at all. And columns, we can do that move too. So those are the three main moves I'm trying to do. I'm trying to manipulate and use the determinant properties so I can change it to turn it back into A. I want this to appear here and here. I'm gonna turn B and C into A, essentially. And then along the way, we're gonna to have to use the rules to keep a negative one on the outside or a three on the outside or a two on the outside and keep all these numbers. And then when we get to A, we know that the determinant of that is three. And then we can simplify and calculate the number for these guys. Let's do that specifically. For B, we're going to have the determinant of B. Now I'm going to take the ticks off, remember. Once the ticks are gone, it's a now a number. This is the determinant of 3A, 6B, 3C, and D, 2E, F, and 1, 4, 3. At first, what you will see is that I have a 3 in all of the entries of the first row. 6 is 2 times 3 is what I'm seeing. So I'm going to factor that out. This is equal to three times the determinant of A to B, C, D to E, F, one, two times two, three. 
I'm already seeing. And now this is what's harder for you at first, but there's also a two in every entry of this column now. So I'm going to factor that out and that's going to give me equals three times two times A, B, C, D, E, F, one, two, three. That's this. Now I know the determinant of that is also a three. So this is three times two times three, which is nine times two, which is 18. This is the determinant and this is what they mean by this. Use the determinant properties. In these ones, we're gonna force you to use the rules, which I said try to avoid, but now you can see this is clever business and we wanna to try to avoid most of these moves except for the safe one where I add a multiple of one row to another row. Let's do C. I, I, the matrix C. I wanna know what the determinant is. And I can see cab and fed are not A, B, C. So how do they do that? Oh, uh, if you interchange, I really like palindromes and the more delapse and stuff like this, but it's not here. But if I permute these guys, I get two English words, cab and fed. So I'm going to suspect that if I put those back, I would have, oh, what's going to happen now? We're going to have to do it twice. What I'm seeing is I may have it just flipped around the column some way, and we're just going to have to keep track of that. Therefore, the determinant of C is the determinant of C, A, B, F, E, D, and 3, 1, 2. And this is, seems like some permutation of the columns. And we like to trick you in the homework assignment ones or these types of ones because I specifically said try to focus on the row operations at first and then they give you ones where it's all the column moves. We're trying to train you that you're allowed to manipulate columns and determinant properties because this is computing a number, not manipulating systems of equations. They look like row operations, but they're determinant operations and you can do the column operations as well. Stop talking and compute. I want the A to be here. I'm In my mind, I need it to look like this eventually. And I have to manipulate using the rules along the way. So A has to go here. So I'm going to interchange, if you want, column 1 and column 2 are going to get interchanged. When I do that, every time I interchange any two columns, I get a negative 1 on the outside. And that will be multiplied by now. This can go A, E, 1, and C, F, 3, and then B, D, 2. And then now, oh, if I flip those, I will have exactly my matrix A on the inside. And so now what I'm going to do is this will be negative one times. Now I'm going to interchange columns two and three to flip these guys around and that will give me another negative. And yeah, if you can see that when you're working with them, you don't like negatives, do two of them at a time and then they will cancel each other out. And this will be now, what do I get? A, B, C, D, E, F, one, two, three. And we know that determinant is a three. So this is equal to three. Negative one times negative one times three is three. This is the idea. These examples are training you to see how to manipulate the moves and how to train yourself to get from these ones back to A. What I want to now do is actually, let's do one more example where I want to start with an arbitrary matrix A that has all non-zero entries possibly, and I want to compute the determinant efficiently. What I'm going to do is use these determinant properties to get a leading one and then get zeros below it and then cofactor expand along that column and then repeat until I have the Matryoshka doll all the way down to, this is the two by two, five by five, four by four, three by three, two by two. Once we have the two by twos and they're all opened up, I compute determinants using that Matryoshka pattern of the determinant properties and cofactor expansion along column one. For an example two, this is probably what you're waiting for. Now I have cofactor expansion. Now I have all the determinant properties, in particular the first three determinant properties are the ones that I want to focus on. In unison to that, I have a fairly efficient way of computing the determinants. We're going to get a leading one in the top left corner. We're going to eliminate below. Sometimes if you have a bunch of zeros already, you may want to cofactor expand along the one that has the most zeros. If you had three zeros already, that was the work that we had, so I would pick that one. If the four and the two were zeros, I would immediately want to cofactor expand along row three because I won't have to compute those cofactors, but they're not. This was a four and this is a two. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ignore that four and stick to my plan. When I'm given a big matrix, I'm going to get a leading one, get zeros below, cofactor expand along the first column and keep going. Therefore, to compute the determinant of this, the determinant of A is equal to, I'm already going to take out a negative out of the first row. So negative one times, and then what do I have? One, negative two, two, negative one, because I took a negative one out of every entry in the top row. And then I have negative two, seven, three, two, negative two, four, zero, two, negative one, five, one, five. I did the first move when I was writing it down, so I'd have to copy that out again. Now that I've taken that out, that's going to stay in the front. Now what why did I do that? Because I have a leading one. Now what I want to do is use the safest property, property three, which says I'm allowed to 
replace these rows by manipulating them by adding them to multiples of row one. So we're going to do row two goes to row two plus two row one, row three goes to row three plus two row one, and row four is going to go to row four plus row one. And that is going to be equals because all three of those are property three and it will not change the determinant at all. So this is going to be the negative one that I still had. And then this determinant will not change other than the fact that we can change the entries. One, negative two, two, negative one. Now I'm multiplying by two for the next two operations. So negative two plus two is zero. Seven minus four is three. Three plus four is seven. Two minus two is zero. In the next one, we're multiplying by two again. This will be negative two plus two is zero. Four minus four is zero. Zero plus four is four. And two minus two is zero. Ooh. And then what we're gonna do is multiply by one or just add them together. Negative one plus one is zero. Five minus two is three. One plus two is three and five plus negative one is four. Now I have a choice actually, I could cofactor expand along this one or this one because I got the same number of zeros in this row or, or this column and this row. So I would have choice, but I'm gonna stick to my guns. The whole point was I want a leading one and then I want to cofactor expand along this column. This is going to be technically equal to A11C11 plus A21C21 plus A31C31 plus A41C41. A cofactor tried along the first column, but this is zero. This is zero. And this is zero by using my properties. I've made those zeros, so I don't care. I don't care. I don't care what those are. Why would I compute those? Those are all three by three determinants, you realize, because we're starting with a four by four matrix. Those are, I don't want to compute those, gone. And then that's why I'm using the properties, so I don't have to compute those three three by three determinants. That would be horrible, but it doesn't matter. So we're reduced now to this determinant is just literally A11 times C11. That's it. This is C11. This is A11. So this is, uh, don't forget your negative one. This is the negative one that we originally had. So that's the negative one that we had from this move times A11 times C11, which is this. Three, seven, zero, zero, four, zero, three, three, four. Now I will, because I didn't make this one up, Mark Solomonovich made this one up, so I stole it from him and I didn't know that that was going to happen. Now what I'm going to do, because I already have that, again, this computation will be, cofactor expanding along that row will be A, if this is the new matrix, this will be A21C21 plus A22C22 plus A23C23. But this is zero, so I don't care. And this one is zero. So I don't care. And all we're going to have to do is compute that one times that one. So now let's cofactor expand along that. But be careful, we have to use our checkerboard too. Plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. So it is plus. What? Go back and look at the previous videos on how to cofactor expand. What I'm doing there is this one now is equal to the negative one. That one can go away. But now we're cofactor expanding. It's going to be four times blocking off the Greek cross which is going to give me three, zero, three, four, which is going to give me negative four times 12 minus zero is 12, which is negative 48. Compute that using the definition. Yeah, I don't know, that's 24, four factorial is 24, you'd have to compute 24 terms, all of which has four numbers product. I don't know how you're gonna get all that. Yeah, I'm not gonna use the definition. So then what are we going to use? Cofactor expansion blindly along this. If I cofactor expand, you can technically do that. I'm pretty sure that's what Mark actually asked in the book. Cofactor expand along any row or column you want. I would pick the one that has at least has one zero. But if you foolishly cofactor expand along row one, you have to compute four three by three determinants. The way I did it, I had to compute one three by three determinant. Then one two by two determinant. Then that two by two determinant, I compute the number negative 48. So this is the Matryoshka doll. I start with four by four. I do leading one zeros. I cofactor expand. I got one three by three. 
then I do the same thing usually. But as soon as I have a row or a column that has all zeros except for one entry, I use that row and then we get one two by two I had to compute. So all the way down, this is the idea of using cofactor expansion and those three pr determinant properties in unison to efficiently compute determinants. Please subscribe right here, hit the notification bell, and I'll see you next time.